I would now like to introduce our keynote speaker. This is interesting. It's very uh, applicable for the sign of the times. Um, Sh Shmulek Fishman is co-founder and president of Olua, O-O-L-L-O-A, Olua, a platform for the future of work. This company provides a suite of products for gig economy companies and the contractors, including everything from meter insurance to payout service. Shmulek launched Ula in February 2015. He was previously director of business intelligence and automation at Adapt TV, a startup focusing on online video and management. Previously, he worked for uh, World Financial Desk, a high-frequency trading firm in New York City, and was also associate with Merrill Lynch in San Francisco. He graduated with a B in business and economics at Hampshire College and received a post-bachelorette degree in business from Columbia University. Today, Mr. Fishman will speak to us about trends in the gig economy that will affect the surplus lines marketplace for years to come. Please give a warm welcome to Shmulek Fishman. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. Um, let's see, I'm going to figure out how to use this clicker. Let's hope it works. Hmm. Does this uh, hit it on the table? <laughs> That's going to be, that will be really interesting. Ah, got it. Um, so I, I'm here in, uh, today, and we're going to talk about three uh, topics. The first is um, I've done a lot of thinking about what's changed in the world of work, and I'll, I'll take you through some of the findings that I have. And then we can talk a little bit about uh, what Alua is doing today, how it's solving some of the, the shifts in the gig economy. And then third, I have a, a little trick um, or a little secret about how to spot new trends um, that you can use in your own businesses, in your own conversations. So let's jump right in. Um, what changed? It seems like I have to hold this up. So 80 years ago, um, I was not alive, but um, uh, a really interesting uh, act came into place. In 1938, uh, the, the federal government established the Fair Labor Standards Act. And all these things that we think about as bedrock fu fundamental aspects of work, the notion that there's a 40-hour work week, the notion that there's overtime, this, these concepts about uh, employees or contractors, all these, all these uh, notions that we think are very normal, actually just about 80 years old. We came up with all of these things because there were problems in the world of work. People were going into factories and working these long hours, there weren't notions of what a fair wage was, and we wanted to fix it. Um, we're sort of at this moment again. We have a, a framework that was built for another time, and we need to shift to something new. So this law was really great 80 years ago. We're now noticing some challenges in the economy, and it's time for, it's time for us to rethink it. And I'm a huge picture guy, so there's a visual way to do this as well. If you look at Ford's factory in 1941, this was the pinnacle of work. Right? This, was the, this was the epicenter of what it meant to have a job. Everybody went to this factory. Right? They produced widgets and they went home. Right? This is Uber's factory, although I don't think Travis wants me to call it that. Um, this is Uber's factory today. There's way fewer people going into it. Their workers are actually out on the field. Uber calls it a digital mesh. Right? There's all these people that are outside that are doing work that's very transactional based. These are two very different uh, factories and they call for very different rules of the road. If you like data instead of photos, I can do this with data as well. If you go look at uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics and you, you look at how many 1099 forms are being filed, the rate of acceleration in that, versus how many W-2 forms are being filed, you're seeing that W9, uh, excuse me, a, a 1099 uh, work is increasing much faster. More people that are entering the economy for work to get their first and second and third job are doing so in the gig economy, not as W2. And these are some also some trends this is from the Wall Street Journal. What you're seeing is that nine to five employees are decreasing amongst the population of 19 to 30, uh, 31 year olds. And the people that consider themselves independent contractors that's increasing. Now these are modest increases. One's going from 80 to 75 percent and the other is going from 14 to 18 percent. But these trends are going to continue and we need to situate um, the way that we think about 
the world of work around these trends. Um, oops, how do I go back one? Ooh. <laughs> Thank you. So what changed? I think two fundamental things have changed. The first thing is that the phone is now the office. This is a huge change. We all think that when we go to work, it's because we enter an office building, right? And we sit down at a desk. I'm letting you know that most people who are 25 and 23 do not think that way. They think the phone is the office and they get all their work from there. And the second thing is these individuals think that they're their own company. They're their own business. They have their own economic incentives. So work is becoming very transactional. Instead of nine to five, you have these 45 minute, 20 minute jobs, right? Think of an Uber driver, think of a, a Postmate a courier. These are jobs that happen in very small increments of time. Um, and another key thing that's happening is that technology is disrupting everything, right? Because we have all this data coming from phones, we have fundamentally reshifted how we can think about work. And we're gonna talk about it a little bit today. Um, Sidetrack for a second just to prove this point even further. Um, there's a really interesting ad campaign going on with McDonald's. Um, in fact, last year they spent more money on this ad than Uber spent on ads for recruiting drivers. And what does this ad say? It says, McDonald's is committed to being America's best first job. Why are they saying this? They're saying this because it's really hard to get people that want to go to McDonald's to flip burgers because the people that want to flip burgers actually are more interested in driving around in an Uber car or delivering food from Whole Foods. McDonald's is scared of this trend too, right? This is not that something that's happening in Silicon Valley, some tech nerds are thinking about it, right? This is a trend that's affecting very large established businesses. So we can talk about this problem at length. I do it professionally. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the real trick is figuring out how to solve it. What is the solution to it? Where can we skate towards? Um, how can we actually embrace these changes? Um, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what we're doing at Alua to, to help this trends continue. So this is actually what is happening for, the, uh, for a huge cohort of, of workers today. They get up in the morning, they say, uh, I, they open their phone, and they say, hey, what jobs are there? And there's a job at 10 a.m. to walk dogs. It's a company called Rover. If you have a dog, and Joy and I have been discussing this, if you have a dog, you should check out this platform. You click a button and somebody comes and gets your dog and walks it and returns it for you. Crazy, right? Uh, but there's a bunch of people that log on in the morning, they click this button, they go get some dogs, they walk them, and then at 12 they say, hey, I'm gonna deliver some packages for Best Buy. Right? And they do that for a couple hours. And after that, they drive some cars. And after that, they, they uh, do, uh, um, uh, unbox things for, for Winola, which does a lot of work for Macy's. And what you're noticing is that we're mapping together somebody's day. But this day is not one job. It's 20 jobs. And it's not for one company. It's for many companies. And because we have all this data and technology is disrupting everything, we're able to see when you know, Joe, Susan, Bob, Greg, when they're working, when they're waiting for the next job, when they're off. We can very precisely uh, splice this data. This is a huge opportunity, by the way, for the world of insurance. It means that you know exactly where the risk is and what type of risk there is. We can get it down to the millisecond now. There's, in, 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 in my line of work, I classify these, three the, these, these gig workers in three ways. There's one type of uh, a, a cohort of people that also have a W, a standard nine to five job or a W2 job, um, and they're also providing work to, uh, to the gig economy. That's section A. The vast majority of these workers are providing 30 to 60 hours to multiple platforms, five or six platforms. And there's a third cohort of workers that, are, that really love walking dogs. They love walking dogs so much that they just walk dogs 50 or 60 hours a week, right? Or deliver packages 50, 60 hours a week. These are the type of, of workers that we have today. Um, and another interesting thing uh, that, that I've started to realize is that all these jobs, 80% of it is the exact same thing. 
the, the, the skills that we're looking for to walk a dog, to deliver a package, to be an Uber driver, 80% of these skills are actually incredibly similar. There's some things that are different, right? Obviously, if you're walking a dog, you need to have some skills around um, being courteous around the street, right? Uh, to have uh, communication skills that might be different than if you're boxing uh, or unboxing things at Macy's. But the vast majority of all these jobs are interchangeable. And it's the reason why the Uber driver is also the task rabbit. It's the reason why the person that's on task rabbit is also on Postmates. It's because these all are interchangeable uh, forms of work. What, what we're doing is we're building a system that provides professional services to these workers, right? So everything from paying them, to renting them phones, to getting them insurance, um, to, to finding new gigs for them, this is one system that we can offer them. And there's a lot of people in this space. I have uh, in no way a monopoly around this, right? But these are professional service organizations that offer services to this new brand of work. It's an opportunity for all of us. And it's always helpful when you can sort of put this in your own, um, in your own day. Um, we're all consumers of these demand sources. So anybody in this room use Uber? Some people? Yes, so I call Uber a demand source. It provides, it, it, it has a service that's a demand-based service. We're customers of it. And the drivers on Uber, I call them agents. And I can remap this over and over and over again to smaller platforms. Um, if, if you want food from Whole Foods, there's a company called Delive that will bring it to you, right? So you're a customer, Delive is the demand source, Whole Foods is the supplier, and the person that's delivering the food is the agent. You can keep doing this over and over and over again. Um, we're all vendors, insurance carriers, brokers, right? And we have this huge opportunity to provide services to demand sources, which is what we've been doing, that's what you provide to Ford, right? But also to provide them to agents. Um, and the way this works is it's about building this triangle over and over again, right? There's always these two connections to be had in this new economy. The first one is, is what we all know. It's about providing services to these large companies, what I call a demand source. And the second one that's becoming way, way more important uh, for me is providing services to these agents at scale. And let me tell you why this works. You don't, um, this is not like you need to call up 100,000 people every day. The reason why this works is because all of these agents have phones, and these phones are always connected to a central nervous system. It allows you to understand exactly where these people are, surface information to them exactly when you need it to be, um, and you, you really understand what's going on in their day. And I would challenge all of us to think how we can use data and these phones that are out on the field to all of our, better, uh, uh, to, to all of our betterment, right? Um, how did, how did I spot this, or how, how is it that we're able to talk about this? Uh, there's, a, there's a really good documentary on the internet by a guy named Kirby, um, and he says that everything is a remix, that everything that we think is new and is innovative is actually just a remix of something that already exists. Let me give you an example to help frame it. Who's seen a James Bond movie? Yeah, so that's a remix. The reason why that's a remix is because it's the same film every single year. Every year it's the same exact film, they just change who plays the villain, sometimes they change who plays James Bond, right? But it's the same thing over and over again, but it's interesting each time. They're remixing something. We'll try another one. Um, who uses Amazon? Yeah, that's a remix. The reason why that's a remix is because you have an online website that acts exactly like a catalog. Remember those catalogs where you would get it in the mail and you would pick the things that you wanted and you would call them up? That's what Amazon does. They just digitize that, right? We can do this again for Uber. Uber is a remix. There's always been taxi cab companies. There's always been a way to call a taxi cab and get them to come to your front door wherever you are. They're just adding in technology to it. I have a remix too. It's not, I didn't invent this. All we're doing is taking a professional service organization that's been around for a very long time, grouping them into pools of workers, right, and giving them all technology so they can, they can get work in volume, right? And so there's a little bit of a math formula to this. 
or a, a science a science formula to this. It's called copy, transform, and combine. And I'm going to ask all of you to think about this in your businesses. What you do is you take two ideas. We can take the Amazon one again, right? Catalog plus distribution system. You take these two things, you combine, you copy them, or as Steve Jobs would say, we would steal them. Um, but uh, uh, we'll use copy because it's friendlier. Uh, you copy them. You, uh, you transform them in some way. You make them a little bit different than they were before. And then you, you combine them. You offer a new service to the public. Right? I think that this is what's the most innovative things that we can think of in our culture today are using this formula. It's something that we do every day at Alua. Um, and it's something I, I ask all of you to do as well in your own businesses. So that, it's a little bit about the economy, what we're doing, and a little trick. Um, I hope you found this talk interesting. Um, and I hope you have a bunch of questions for me as well, because I hope this stirred your, your imagination a little bit this morning. But thank you. <laughs> Yes. Uh, it's a it's a phenomenal question. They expect that they're going to be doing this, and that's a very hard concept for even me to understand because I like going to a desk, right? Um, I really enjoy that myself. Uh, but they think they're going to do this for the next fifty or sixty years. They really do think it. Uh, we poll it all the time. We're um, we're voracious pollsters of the agent pool that we have, um, and they think this is going to be their life's work, that they're going to do all these different gigs, that they're going to collect money from all these different sources, they're going to go on trips and vacations, and they're going to be artists, but this is how they're going to make a living. And they think it's a good living, too. They're not, um, when, you, when you poll them, they're not negative on this. They think it's really cool that they can work for five or six different companies, they all give them money, um, and they can choose when they want to work. They're, they're relatively positive on this trend. It's hard to conceptualize, though. Yeah, <laughs> um, with regards to the technology that's out there, like driverless cars, do yes. they worry that that innovation will disrupt their current workplace? So I think that Uber would love to get rid of all the humans. Um, uh, <laughs> um, in fact, uh, if it, I've, I've been uh, fortunate enough to listen to Travis talk. He wants to get rid of the humans as quickly as possible. Um, but uh, I think that the, the mistake that we make is somehow Uber is the only gig economy company that's out there. There's a couple hundred of them, actually. Um, and I think it's going to be really hard um, for the next hundred years um, let's take an example that uh, we study a bunch. Have you, have you been to a Starbucks recently? I think the ability to automate the work that's going on behind that counter is relatively hard. A robot ain't coming there soon. Um, I think that that's going to be difficult. But what will happen is that the person that's doing the latte is also delivering boxes because that work is relatively similar. And so what you're going to see is a lot of uh, people moving around from job to job to job. But I don't think that autonomous cars somehow shuts this economy down. It's one small bit of it. Right? There's, there's 160,000 um, Uber drivers in California. Right? So like, that sort of that gives you like a little size and weight. Artificial intelligence is uh, growing at a rapid rate. Rapid... Do you agree with that? That artificial intelligence is real? It's growing at a rapid rate. Rapid... Yes, um, very rapidly. Would you also agree that the basic of automation and, and computer systems, the basic theory behind it, is to automate repetitive tasks? Yes. However, I think that there's a, there's a separation between artificial intelligence and uh, what I would call menial work or, or repetitive tasks. If you go look at, like, Google is spending a ton of money on AI. They're really spending money on, on intellectual problems. Uh, how do I cure diseases faster? Um, uh, uh, how do I solve a very complicated math equation faster? Um, they're not actually that interested in figuring out how to automate latte sales. Watson can, the Watson computer system in microseconds can analyze every single uh, yes. paper done on any given disease yes. in microseconds and, and deliver that information to an automated searchable uh, yes. robot.
uh, I think that Watson is very good at figuring out, uh, hopefully very good at figuring out cures to things. I think that's... And that's the point I'm going with this, is that 100 years ago, they didn't think anyone was going to be able to fly. Yeah. And what I'm suggesting to you is that there isn't any repetitive task that cannot eventually be replaced or done by a robot. Perhaps. Um, I think that it's a, it's a fascinating conversation. I think we're further away from it than we think. There's a, a really good uh, venture capitalist in the Valley uh, that said, uh, you know, we watched the Jetsons when we were young, and I was promised a flying car, and instead I got 120 characters on Twitter. So there's, there's like, the, you, you are right. You are right. There is this, um, like, 19... Developed in Belgium right now. Yes, there is this 1984 scenario that, that can definitely happen. I just think it's, um, the spacing in our minds needs to be a little bit broader. Well, as I used to tell my wife, when I get too old to drive, I won't have to worry about it. There you go. I will, I'll be around for, for the rest of the day. If, oh, there's more. The, uh, part of the allure of a traditional W-2 job yes. is the benefits package. Yes. So is anybody moving to address that in the gig economy? So, uh, it, uh, yes. Um, there's a great company called uh, Stride um, that's doing some of this where they can offer benefits to uh, some basic benefits. It's not as robust as it, it needs to be, in my opinion, but some basic benefits. The other way to, to work on this is, uh, I think that the core underpinning of, of W-2 work is that there's workers' comp insurance for on-the-job on uh, injuries. I mean, we have a solution for that uh, called occupational accident insurance, which has uh, been around for a very long time for truckers, right? Um, this is also a great uh, first probe into solving that equation. I mean, you can offer that on a metered rate. That's one of the things we're doing. See, I, I think there's a societal problem underpinning this, which is that people will become more dependent on government services that don't, you know, don't, aren't satisfactory or don't exist. Yeah. And, and, it, and there's an implicit sort of mindset that, oh, I'll go to the emergency room, I'm indigent, I won't have to pay. Okay, well, all right, so depending on how affordable care goes. But, yeah. um, you know, in any number of, of other scenarios where yeah. they say, well, I can't afford it, it's not there, but I'll try to Sort of finesse it somehow. Yeah. Uh, I'll say two things really quickly. One, all these people think they're invisible um, and that they can't get hurt, um, which is a which is a, a more of a, a, a mental problem than anything else. Uh, the, the the second is is that they're actually willing to pay for things themselves. The, the they're they're actually interested in in paying for their own way. Uh, the trick is solving the first part. What we have to convince all these, uh, all these, uh, uh, I, I guess I'm old enough now to say kids, uh, what we have to convince all these people um, is that they need these types of products. They're willing to pay for them themselves. They're not interested in handouts as, as much as we think. Um, but it's a longer conversation. I don't want to uh, take up all the time. I know that there's, there's real business to do. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm here for the rest of the day and, and happy to answer more questions. Thanks so much.